Well, come on, church, can we give Jesus some praise today? He alone is worthy to be praised. Amen and amen. Hey, so blessed to be here with you this morning, church. I bring greetings from Mount Clemens, Michigan. Anyone know where Mount Clemens is? Yeah, yeah. more people than uh, the previous service. Hey, so so glad to be here with you, and uh, it's such a blessing. And you need to know this. I absolutely love this church. I love this area. I love this city. I love y'all's vision for this church and for this city, and I absolutely uh, love you your pastors as well, your leadership. Uh, so grateful to be here. Uh, it's a blessing to me. I, I also wanted to take just a moment and celebrate uh, that there is someone else tuning in, and that is uh, my home church, New Anthem Church in Mount Clemens. They're all tuned in right now, watching on a screen in our auditorium. Can we welcome them as well? Amen. We love you guys, we miss you, but right now Holland is tough to beat, so uh, we're glad that we're here, and I'm excited to be bringing you the word this morning. Uh, I have a question I wanted to start with, and that is, have you ever in any season of your life felt completely empowered uh, to the point where you like felt like a superhero? Like you felt like a superhero. Have you ever felt so empowered because of some season or situation, something happened in your life that empowered you to the point where you feel so special, so empowered, you feel like you could conquer the world, conquer the universe. I've had several seasons like that in my life. I've heard that people that go skydiving feel that way, like when, they done, when they're done, if they survive. Like they, they, they feel that way, like they could conquer the world. I'm not stupid enough to try skydiving. I remember a specific time when I was younger uh, that I was, like the time that I really felt like I can do anything, I can conquer the world, was the time I beat my father at a foot race. Now, I was at the age of 16, and that might bother some of you. That might bother some of you. Be like, 16 years old, That's a, this seems a little old to be a, finally beating your father at a foot race. Get off my back about it, okay? I was running my fastest. I was doing my best. But here's why that story is actually really sad, because if you remember this from the last time I preached here, my father is this tall and the whitest guy in the world. But nonetheless... When I beat him, I gloated so hard, I felt so good, I've been trying to for years, and I finally beat him at a foot race. And a, a more recent example of a time I felt so empowered that I felt like a superhero was when I was, uh, it was actually a few months ago, it was in the spring, and y'all remember how crazy things were back in March? Like, like the, everything was locked down. I don't know how things were over here on the west side, but over on the east side, things would get a little bit crazy, and, and everyone was kind of locked down and trapped in their homes, and no one knew what was going on, and, and masks were kind of a new thing, and, and no one was really used to that. And so my wife, God bless her, she was such a trooper. She did the majority of our grocery shopping. And it was always just like, she'd always like emotionally prepare to go out. I'm like, what's going on? What's the big deal? And she, was, she would always talk about how crazy things were at the grocery stores, because again, I'm sure everyone's super nice over, over here, but over on the east side, we're all jerks, right? And everyone's just mean and angry and everyone has masks on, everyone's stressed out and scared and all this stuff. And so um, she would tell me like, things are just crazy, like when you go. And so I only went grocery shopping a handful of times, but I had a, a, a very real reality set in for me when I did and I would go out and I was like this is crazy and, and did you ever did you begin to feel like when you had to go out like it was an apocalypse movie and you had to go out in a supply run like it was a zombie apocalypse and you had to go get supply like that's what it began to feel like and, and here's what happened to me now I um in April I actually came down with COVID-19 and if you're wondering like to yourself man was it was it in a great experience it was an awful experience but here's what happened, I, I got the virus. They're like, they, I, I, here it is, this is the reality. It was not great for me and it was, it was a really crazy season of life and a crazy couple of weeks fighting off this virus. And, and I had this moment where, um, and, I, and I could share a story about how really I believe God uh, healed me and, and delivered me from this virus. But so I, I, at the end of it, 
I, I, I've been healed. I, I, I no longer have symptoms. Um, what happened was I, you feel like a superhero, right? You finally get to go outside. You finally get to see the real world. And, and what happened? I'm looking around at all these people and they're emotional, they're terrified, and they have, they have their mask on, masks on. And here I am, and I just feel like a super. I can feel the germs. I can feel COVID-19 just bouncing off of me like I'm Superman. They're just bullet, tink, tink, tink. They're just bouncing. Like, this is what I felt like. And I'm pretty sure some point in these couple of weeks as I'm celebrating how empowered that I felt, I don't know if it was the news or the government heard me. I don't know what it was. But all I know is I started scrolling through Facebook and watching the news reports and scrolling through, and, and, and this was the news that was released. You can now get COVID three times, six times, 10 times, 100 times. If you've had it, it doesn't mean anything because you could just get it again. But that doesn't change the fact that for a few short weeks, I felt empowered and I felt like a superhero. I share all of that today because of this. There is a power for every single one of us that you were created to walk in and you were created to wield and you were created to move in. And this is a power given to you by the God of the universe. This power cannot be manufactured by anything that we could conjure or come up with here with our own earthly ability. This power can't be added to. This power can't be taken from. And this power ultimately is purpose to drive us to become more like God and to discover more who God is. And this power isn't like good vibes. This power isn't, doesn't come from good feelings. It doesn't come from karma and it definitely doesn't come from essential oils because this power, friends, is power in the holy word of God. Amen. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to build some context around this text. What does it mean to have power in the Word of God? Maybe some of us are here today and you thought we were reading about an ancient text that maybe just had good advice, that had teaching from someone who's a good uh, teacher, who was a good moral philosopher. Friends, the stories that we read in this text, what we're gonna be discovering today as we take apart the scripture and find out what the scripture says about itself is that there is a power that we wield and we can walk in that can impact our life in a supernatural way. Amen. So let's pray this morning and then we'll dive into the word of God. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every single person in this room, every single person tuned in, watching by way of Facebook, watching by way of YouTube. And God, I pray you open up your word to us right now. We give recognition to your spirit that's present here this morning in the room with us today, wants us to leave here changed and transformed. But God, we need you to open up your word so that can happen. And so God, we ask by the power of your spirit, would you just allow that? We pray for light and heat, that you would shine some light on maybe even the dark places of our walk with you, the dark places of our heart and life. And we pray you'd set our hearts ablaze, God. We pray for heat, that you'd set us on fire, get us excited and passionate about you, as even in a season of such uncertainty. God, we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen, amen. So, so I wanna build some, some scriptural context around where I'm going. If we're gonna define what the word of God is and the power that it has, we need to define what the word of God is through the word of God. We need to understand the functionality, if you will, of the word of God from the word of God. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16. says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Isn't it interesting that the, the boiled down functionality of the word of God is mostly things that many of us, if we were being honest with ourselves, just don't like. Like many of us would read this like, yeah, no, we've read that before. Some of us have been around church a while. We've, we've read that verse before. But if we're, if we're getting into the nitty gritty of this verse, the, the rebuking, the correcting, this is a function of the word of God. And yet, if we were to look at our own lives, if we were to be honest with our own selves, our own personalities, many of us 
at a glance would say, yeah, most of those things, most of those functions, not a huge fan of. Most of those functions, if I could avoid those at all costs, I would prefer to do so. Let's look at some other functions of the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This is the word of God. So God is going to use his word. First of all, it's alive and it's active. It's a live, active, breathing document. And this word of God, God's going to use in his power, not to bludgeon us like a bully, but just like a surgeon to carefully cut away what? The dead things in our life, the toxic things in our life. God is going to use his word to cut these dead things out. But you see, a sword doesn't just have a sharp edge. It also has a pointy end. This pointy end is our offensive part of this weapon that we're used to smite down what? The enemy, the toxic lies that he would try to speak into our life, the toxic things he would try to bring into our life to tempt us with. We use the word of God functionally to smite these negative negative things down in our life. So this is the word of power. It's one of the very few books, the word of God is, that when we read it, it reads you. Like, and like, here's an example. Like, have you ever gotten really mad at your pastor? Let me, let me explain. Like, I get mad at your pastor all the time. It's confession time. I'm sorry, Pastor Brian. I got it. I get mad at you all the time. Here's why I get mad at Pastor Brian. Sometimes I, I watch your sermons like every, every week. I watch your services and it, it always inspires me. It's always so good. I love tuning in every single week and feeds my soul. I have church after church. I go home and pull up and get his service and, and I'll be watching. And every now and then I'll set my phone down or I'll be watching on the TV and I'll be doing some other things as I'm listening to the sermon and uh, probably like many people that maybe are tuned in right now and kind of doing some other things and listening to the sermon. And every now and then I'll have to pause and, and I'm like, well, hold on. Is this a message? Is this an Engedi sermon? Or did I FaceTime Pastor Brian because he's speaking directly to me? He's speaking exactly to my situation, exactly to my insecurities, exactly to a failure that I had last week, some issue that I'm in. He's speaking directly to it. Who told him? Like, who does he think he is? Like, I get mad at him all the time, but we all know this, right? That this isn't Pastor Brian. This is the power, right, of the word of God. It's not your pastor that judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, according to Hebrews 4, verse 12. And what I love about your pastor is that he stands on the word of God. Your pastor doesn't add to the scripture. He doesn't take from the scripture. He stands on the scripture. But watch this. No matter how much you feel like your pastor nails it in any given certain week, it's not your pastor that's making the word come alive. Because the word of God, all by itself, is alive, and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It wants to change and transform you. This is a function of the word of God, amen? So, so let's go into our theme text today. We're gonna be in Psalms. We're gonna look at David's writing. We're gonna be in Psalms chapter one. We're gonna start right at verse one. If you're tuned in now, you can go to the BibleGateway.com and just type in uh, Psalms chapter one or go to the Bible app and do the same. Uh, and we're gonna start right at the beginning of verse one. And, and David here is gonna give us some context. He's gonna give us a little bit of structure to, to what is it? what are the results, what are the effects for our heart when it comes to embracing the power of the word of God, what can we expect? What do we need to avoid? And what is gonna ultimately the, bl bl bless the blessing going to be that we can receive as followers of Jesus when we do this? Psalms chapter one, verse one says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Uh, so what are the results for us? What are the results for our heart when it comes to embracing the power of the word of God? Well, if you're a note taker this morning, I wanna encourage you to write this down. Number one, you're gonna find help for your soul. 
You're going to find help for your soul. Let's take verse 1 apart. It says this, blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. And if we were to peel back the transla tra uh, translation layers to the word blessed, what we'll find is we're, we're talking about this everlasting joy, this peace, this hope. And in the Hebrew, this word is actually plural. So this actually suggests a multiplicity of blessing or a, an intensity of blessings. We're going to have blessings upon blessings, and these blessings upon, upon blessings is guaranteed to a person who, first of all, avoids some things. Well, what are we avoiding, Pastor John? I'm glad you asked. According to verse 1, what we're avoiding is walking with stupid people, hanging out with stupid people, and doing what stupid people do. <laughs> Sorry, that was the, the Pastor John translation. Who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. A life of bliss, layers upon layers of blessing and a life of joy is, is guaranteed to the one who, first of all, doesn't hang out or act like these people. Verse two, we continue, it says this, in whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. This is a really critical word for us. This word meditates is, is imperative for us. This is something that, that really we, we don't do a lot of talking about meditation. Now, I need to be clear. I'm not talking the kind of meditation where you would see someone with their legs crossed, sitting on the ground, watching a sunrise or sunset with their arms outstretched and humming a monotone, uh, monotone note. This isn't what we're talking about when we're talking about meditation. Because when we're talking about meditation, we're really talking about enveloping ourselves in the Word of God, saturating ourselves in the Word of God. Are we taking time to do this? Not, not to just read the word. We're reading the word right now. It's, it's, it's on our screen. It's on our phone. It's, it's up on these screens. It's right in front of us. We're reading the word of God, but meditation takes it a step further. Are we thinking upon the things that we're reading? Are we allowing ourselves to not just read the word, but are we giving space and creating space to allow the word of God to read us? And so we need to meditate on it. Interestingly enough, Time Magazine, uh, they had this, uh, uh, their magazine title in 2015. Here, is it, here it is. It says this. You, are, you now have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. Microsoft did a study inside of this article uh, in 2015 and found that, that 15 years into iPhone's evolution, the evolution of the iPhone, the human attention span had dim diminished from 12 seconds to 8 seconds. Like, first of all, like, 12 seconds really isn't that good. Not a great starting point. 8 seconds is even worse. And just for context, like everybody in the room, everyone tuned in online right now, just go ahead and look at my hand. That's it. That's it. Like th th this is the, the, the time, this is the, the length of our attention span. One of the quotes from the study, watch this, says this. We are moving from a world where computing power was scarce to a place where it now is almost limitless and where the true scarce commodity is increasingly human attention. And one of the other statistics in this article was this. The average American checks their iPhone every four minutes. And so we, we become a distracted people. We are a people, have become a people who've, who've lacked some focus. We have become a people that would struggle with this idea or concept of meditation. And now this may be the part of the sermon where many of us are checking out and like, yeah, Pastor John, like we get all those articles. Yes, like we definitely were distracted and all of that. But let's just be real honest. We're just kind of cutting into our time. But the news is so much worse than that, friends, because we're not solely cutting into our time. What we're talking about, what I'm preaching about today is the fact that that part of our lives is cutting into our souls. Amen? And so we're going to find help for our souls when we meditate on the word of God. What else are we going to find? Point number two, if you're taking notes, is this. We're going to find health for our souls. 
We're gonna find health for our souls. Verse three says this of, of Psalms chapter one, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in season. I have a, fr- a question for you today, church. How is your soul today? H- have you been asked that in 2000? If you've been asked that in 2000, have you been honest about your answer? How's your soul today? How's your soul today? You see, the, the answer and how we were, would answer that question is so important to who we are and how we view God. Why? Because God wants our souls healthy. Let's look at a parallel verse. This is a parallel verse that runs in a similar cadence to the Psalms verse that we just read. It's a few books later in Jeremiah 17, seven through eight, it says this. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out of its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear fruit. This is massive, so this takes it a step further, and this would necessitate and indicate to us that when we are planting ourselves, when we're meditating on the word of God, we're doing more than just planting ourselves next to, planting ourselves next to something that's living, something that's going to give us life. When we're meditating on the word of God, we're planting ourselves next to something that's absolutely living, but it's also going to give life, but also is going to ensure that whatever seed Season we are in, regardless of what the social landscape looks like, regardless of who is in office, and regardless of whether there is a vaccine or not, that we've rooted ourselves, rooted our existence next to something living, that's sure, that's everlasting, and that we can anchor and cling our hope to. Amen? And so God wants our souls to be healthy. And what is the result of this? When we find help for our souls because we've anchored our, ourselves to the word of God, embrace the power of the word of God, and we find health for our souls, we're gonna find joy for our souls. We're gonna find joy for our souls. Now, I gotta be real honest with you. I wanted to put another H word there. And some of you OCD people are like, yeah, I noticed that. Wait a minute. Like, I wanted, to put in, I wanted to put happiness so bad. We're gonna find happiness for our souls. But here's why I couldn't write that down, because it's just not true. Because happiness is cheap, and happiness is fleeting, and happiness can be taken from you in an instant. Happiness isn't eternal, and happiness doesn't come from the Lord like joy does. And so rather than just have everything line up perfectly, I wrote down what is actually true. And what is actually true is that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is what comes in the morning and during the night and is going to affect and infect our souls in the best way and drive us into greater and deeper life, John 10, 10, more abundant life. And so we're gonna find joy for our souls. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at, let's finish up verse three. It says this. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in season, watch this, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Whatever they do prospers. This is absolutely huge. See, we're going to be given life, but we're gonna be given joy in the middle of it. This is a result of us rooting ourselves to the word of God. I, w- I wanna share with you a story of how the word of God was used, spoken over my life that impacted me in a powerful way. Before we had launched the church, our church, New Anthem Church, a little over a year ago now, we were about four weeks out. We were four weeks, we're, we, we saw the end in sight, we saw this, this runway, and, and, and here's what happened. I reached this place and, and this point, and I don't really know what happened. I can't really even tell you contextually why this happened, but I just, I didn't want to plant a church anymore. I didn't want to pastor a church. I just, I, I wanted to go back to youth ministry or worship ministry. I just wanted to do anything else. 
And I didn't know what to do with these feelings, but I truly felt if God gave me the option, if God gave me the opportunity to just kind of hit the eject button, I would take it. And I remember I, I drove an hour to see one of my pastoral mentors and, and one of the members of our pastoral board of overseers. And I was like, listen, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. This is one of those like, God, you know, God, let, let this cut pass from me kind of moments. I, I, I want to be done. I, I just, I don't want to do this. I don't know what to do with these feelings. But the planting a church right now, I know we have four weeks to go. I know we have great teams in place. I know we, we're done fundraising. God has shown up in all these ways. And that's awesome. I just don't want to do this anymore. And my pastor, one of my mentors, one of my close friends, he, he opened up the word of God and he turned to Revelations 3.20. And he spoke the word of God over my heart and over my life. And what he said was this. He said, he said, here I am, as he read. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If one would come and open the door, I will come in and I will dine with them and they with me. And he said, Pastor, exhale, breathe out, because your only job in planting this church, in planting this new movement, your only job is to just set the table. It encouraged my faith in the best way. I began to cry, I began to weep. Peace just kind of flooded my heart and flooded my soul. You see, but it wasn't, it wasn't him having the boldness or courage. It wasn't solely him, my pastor, having the courage and boldness to, to say this and speak this over me in boldness. It was the fact that he was speaking the word of God. And that word of God in this moment was speaking to my heart and my soul, penetrating my heart and my soul, cutting away the dead things, cutting away the fear, cutting away the insecurity, cutting away the, the, the anxiety and revealing something about the God of the universe. And what was the end result? Well, I didn't just have a healthier soul by the end of this conversation, but I had joy returned to me. So how could it be that joy is the end result of embracing the power of the word of God? Could it really be that the end game, God's end game with the word of God is that we would have joy in our life, that we would have joy returned to us, even in the areas of things that, that, that which Satan maybe stole from us, that we could have joy returned to us. Well, for the answer, let's look at John 1.1. 1, 1. The, uh, the, uh, the, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, we see in John 1.1, 1, 1, there's this interesting part in the beginning. It says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. You see, we're, we're reading this, but what we're actually talking about is Jesus. It could be read this way. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God, and Jesus was with God in the beginning. See, from the foundations of the world, there Jesus was. Yes, he, we see his birth and his, his, him coming to earth in the Gospels, but in the beginning, there Jesus was eternally with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they were a community amongst themselves. And everything God created, Jesus was there. And the Bible actually talks about how Jesus, by his hand, was everything made. The Bible says, firstborn over all creation. That means the boss of the universe. This is Jesus. And here Jesus was. And now he's being, we're being told that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. Now, let me break it down this way. The Bible is the written word of God. Jesus is the physical personification of God put on skin and bones. And what is the purpose of both? To proclaim, to make famous, and to, so that we can deeper know, appreciate, and love who God is. And friend, let me tell you this morning, your greatest level of joy is found in the revelation of who God is. Your greatest level of joy is found in the revelation of who God is. And that revelation of God is found in the person of Jesus and the power of the word of God. 
We should read it. We should meditate on it. We should be saturated by it. Why? Because we're not just reading about someone. We're not just reading about someone. We're reading to become someone. Amen? And this is the greatest news in the universe. Can we bow our heads this morning? I want to pray maybe for the person who's in the room this morning. Maybe you've never formed a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've heard some of the things that have been read or the things that I've said and they've connected in one way or another, but the truth for you is you've never formed a relationship with Jesus. You've never made the decision to repent, in other words, to turn from the direction that you're going in the direction of Jesus and surrender your life and follow God. I wanna give you that opportunity. Here's the best news in the universe. You don't have to be per perfect. You can be broken, you can be messed up. God wants you just as you are. God's not in love with some future version of you. He's in love with you. And he says, come. I want a relationship with you. I wanna show you things that are gonna blow your mind. And the life that I have in store for you is gonna outweigh anything that you could manufacture or conjure on your own. Will you put your trust in me today? Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're even listening and tuning in. We wanna give you the opportunity to simply say yes to Jesus. So on the count of three, I'm just gonna ask that you just lift your hand in the air. The Bible says when we recognize, uh, the Bible says when you recognize me here on earth, I will recognize you before my Father in heaven. That's the words of Jesus. For everyone that's tuned in, maybe you wanna just put yes in the comment section, either below or to the right of your screen. As in, I'm saying yes to Jesus. I wanna put my hope, faith, and trust in him now and forevermore. So if that's you, on the count of three, just lift your hand in the air. One, God loves you so much. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you all over this room and online, lift your hand up. Lift your hand up. Awesome. God sees it. God sees it. It's the greatest decision you could ever make. Awesome. 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 We see you online as well. I'm going to ask, we just, we're going we're to pray this prayer out loud. Everyone, to your right or your left, we're gonna pray this prayer aloud as one family to support all those that are making this decision. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for me. I confess I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate with those that made first-time decisions? That's amazing. That's amazing. Hey, I say this all the time. It's not a prayer alone that saves you. What a prayer does is it starts a relationship, amen? We're gonna tell you a little bit more about that relationship with Jesus. Can I just pray for you one more time, church? I absolutely love you. We're so excited to see all that God's gonna do. I'm excited for this for the life of this church. God, we thank you for all that you're doing at Engedi Church. We're so thankful just for this moment to celebrate the power of your written word. It's more than just words on a page or words on a screen. No, God, the purpose of your word is to be the revolution and the revelation, the transition of our heart. And so, God, we celebrate that. We embrace the truth of your word. We embrace and activate the power of your word, and we wanna see it play out in our life. Change and transform us as we meditate on it and study it. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Thank you.